Today I want to continue in the, the sermon series from Jonah. And we're in chapter 4 today. In chapter 4, he goes to Nineveh and a whole story is here. And you're going to see how he identified with you or how you identified with him and his trip and the rebellion and the things that he does. Let me give you a little description about the city. We mentioned it's a three-day journey. The city was 30, it was 30 miles long, so from beginning to end. It was 10 miles wide, and it took three days walking across the city. Now, there was a wall around it, and the wall was a 150-foot wall surrounded the city. Uh, it, it could hold three chariots. They could race on top, side by side, and there was 120,000 people in the city. So that's a, a great witness for the Lord, and a great witness for the Lord to send uh, Jonah. But Jonah still went, but he rebelled like you and I do. Let me read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and, because, and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away from my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Verse 4, But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Any right? And Jonah went out and sat down, at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sat in, in it shade and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn, he, the next day, God provided a worm which... Uh, chewed the vine so that it, uh, it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend or make, uh, make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people and you, who cannot uh, tell their right hand from their left. And many ca cattle as well. So... Should I not be concerned about the great city? And you and I need to understand that plant is a very important illustration. And you and I can identify when we have to struggle. When we end this great book with 11 verses jammed into the lens, into human uh, predicaments and the divine solution, God has a way but God's way is not always man's way. God had a reason for Jonah to go to the city, to win the people to, to the Lord, give them a choice. But he even had to deal with a very uh, stubborn person and even showed probably some anxiety and some worry and some depression because he was doing what he didn't want to do, but God used him to win 120,000 people. Now, it's interesting. If you study history, this city, about 100 years later, went back to worshiping heathens. So for 100 years, what Jonah did lasted, and those 120,000 people and their generations thereafter heard the Lord and they followed. First of all, because the king did, and then they did because they heard the word of the Lord, and only the word of the Lord can change you. God's ways are not always man's ways. You ought to write that down. God's ways are not always man's way. And we often rebel or get angry with God when He doesn't accomplish what we feel that He should do in our lives. Well, this morning the mailman drove by. I was waiting at the mailbox to receive the mail. 
And I said, oh, could you take this mail back, please? He says, why? I said, well, there appears to be no money or checks or anything in, the, in, in what you gave me. And we both laughed. And then he said, well, how do you know? I said, well, because if it's a lottery, I've got to buy a ticket. And I hadn't bought a ticket. Well, there's some people who wants a certain thing to happen, but they're not doing their part. And you need to understand God's not a fool. God is not a fool. God cannot be fooled. God cannot be made fun of. God is in control. So God's ways is not man's ways. And when we don't get our way, we rebel. So the question is, what am I rebelling about right now? As we're getting ready to get into the text of this, what am I rebelling about? Am I like Jonah? And my rebellion started right when <laughs> the beginning. I don't want to go there. And then he's still having it, even sitting in the shade. And God says, if you don't want something, why well, give it to you? Uh, Nineveh gave Jonah a royal headache. I mean, it was a headache. He did not want to go to the people. He didn't want to see the people. He did not want to be there. He didn't want to leave home for whatever reason. He became angry. And Jonah's problem was deeply seated in rebellion, which resulted in a spiritual confusion. It was hard to know what to do when you have rebellion in your heart. Folks, rebellion will mess up my life. Rebellion will mess up my relationship with my family and with other people. Because of rebellion, because of sin in my life, it's hard to do what God wants you to do because you're not in communication to Him. When you're burnt out, remember this. And we all get burned out at some time. All of us do. Number one, there's three things we need to do when we're burnt out. Number one, remember personal confusion may be the road to true purpose. I sometimes wonder, am I ever going to get there? Well, true, true. Confusion may be the road to true purpose. So when there is confusion, I've got to go to the Lord and I've got to try to make it right. I go to his word. It seems to always have the answer for me. But the wonderful thing is personal confusion may be the road to true purpose. I'm missing the purpose because of confusion. Give it to God. See, Jonah was more concerned about what he wanted to do than what God wanted. Ooh, I'm guilty of that. God, I, I don't really want to do this. I would rather be doing something else. God, this, I don't want to go to the hospital. God, I don't want to do that funeral. God, I don't want to do that wedding. I don't want to do the counseling. There's a lot of things that come up in the ministry. Uh, I, I, put in the church, put in the ministry, put in your job, whatever it is before your family when you don't have to do that is something's wrong. So Jonah had a short memory. He forgot the faithfulness of God. Why was Jonah so mad? Now this is interesting. And you and I fall in this category. Why was Jonah so mad? You know why? Because he hated the Ninevites. He did not like them. He knew that they were warriors. They had had war with Israel. He had done, he, all he knows is the history was not a good history. And he's going to go help somebody that hurt uh, his people at one time or another. So why was jo uh, Jonah so mad? Same reason you and I are. We're mad because we don't like what's happening. And we need, sometimes we need to have righteous indignation. But some other times we just need to listen to God more. Number two, when you're burnt out, when you're down, remember personal healing is a ministry of grace. Personal healing is a ministry of grace. Only God can give me grace. Now grace is unmerited favor. He shows me favor when I do not deserve the favor. And you and I have no other choice but the choice that God gives us at the time he's given it to us. So personal healing is a ministry of grace, verses 4 through 8. Jonah's anger and stress ran very deep. He wanted to die. He was so fed up. He was so put out. Death sounded better to him than having to go do what he has done. And he's probably made a little afraid to go home and find out, let them know what happened. His own comfort was more important to him. His own comfort was more important to him than the souls of the Ninevites. Folks, 120,000 people could die and go to hell because Jonah was selfish and uncomfortable and not wanting to do what he wanted to do. He was prejudiced. And you and I fall into that category again. God knocks on our door and says, I need you to go next door and meet your neighbor. Knocks on your door and he says, welcome the, the, the person waiting on you. Uh, don't forget to sh give them a good tip because they're going to judge you by what you give. You know, let God speak and let us listen. Let us listen. So he was more important to him than the souls of Nineveh. 
How many times have we reacted the same way? How many times have we turned our back on what God has put in our life? How many times have we walked right by hurting people? How many times have we walked by people that need help lifting heavy uh, things out of their basket at the grocery store or wherever? How many times? How many times have you helped an elderly person on a walker get across the street? How many times have you helped someone who's on a walker or a cane or whatever if, if, to hold your arm or at least offer to be balanced to them? Folks, that's ministry. People are what we live here for until God calls us home. We don't have other things to minister to but people. And you and I need to be prepared for that and we need to learn from Jonah. So how many times, how many times have we reacted just like Jonah? How many times? I want my way, not God's way. God's not giving me what I want. Or say you do get a certain vehicle and, and you look inside of it and you, you're, it's a gift from your wife and she's already paid for it. And you look inside and you don't, you, all of a sudden you start saying, well, the screen up in front's too small and it's a, it's, it's a standard shift. I don't like standard shift. It doesn't have leather seats, it has cloth seats. Uh, the color is not really the color I wanted. Well, folks, a lot of us are that way. We immediately look at what's wrong instead of what's right. And most of the time, the right outweighs the wrong, but we t our, our culture is teaching us negative, 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 like Jonah. But his is a big negative. He's upset because God led him to do something he didn't want to do. He's probably preaching the whole time under his breath saying, don't listen to me, don't listen to me. But God takes even someone's mouth that is silent and speaks. I remember in the Old Testament, he spoke through a prophet, uh, through a donkey. So I always say, if he can use a donkey, he can sure use you and me. And Jonah was used whether he wanted to or not, because God had a purpose. God had something for him to do. It is only the fool that believes he or she doesn't need God. Doesn't need God. God continues to use you and I, even when you are out of his will. Thank God for his grace. He looks at you as if you've never sinned. He treats you as he would treat any family member. You are adopted into the family of God. He looks at you and says for some reason he's forgot who brought him to the place he's at. You think he'd want to be telling other people about himself. And then number three, when, you, when you're burnt out, remember personal compassion for others is a result. Personal compassion. Compassion is... God's loving through you, or it's love in action. So personal compassion, love in action for others is the result whenever I'm willing to turn to God and say, here I am I, Lord, here am I, use me. God's compassion extended to the whole world, not just to Nineveh, it's extended to the whole world, all the world at that time and the world today. There's not a place that we've not either flown over or been there in this world because there is something to look at and something to pray about and something to say, Lord, is that where I should stop? Lord, am I supposed to speak with that person? So God's compassion extends throughout the whole, whole world. And it's not uh, merely restricted to those whom Jonah and you and I. How about you? What are you not doing because of your prejudice? What are you not doing because the color of someone's skin? What are you not doing because uh, they, they speak a different language than you do? Why? See, you go into a restaurant and you eat a certain food. If anybody else is eating any other food, if you're not careful, you judge. Well, they don't realize how good my food is, and they're probably looking at you and saying, how could you eat that? But folks, it doesn't really matter. God concludes the story with a lingering question to Jonah. A lingering question. Should I have compassion on Nineveh? Well, the answer should be absolutely. Absolutely you should have that. Absolutely. See, my Nineveh is where I live. My Nineveh is where I lived. At uh, 21 years of age, or 20, 20 years of age, I was working highway construction to, to go back to state college for the next semester. And uh, there was a man there, a black man. All I know him by was Brother Jackson. From day one, he and I served on the same crew out on the highway. We put concrete for curb and gutter, and we uh, took care of the needs of getting that highway ready to pour. And every day, he had to say, Brother John, I'm praying for you. 
Then he'd call me brother, and I'd say, I'm not your brother. Now, folks, I'm going to show you the basically ignorance and prejudice I had. I said, see my skin? That's not black, so I'm not your brother. He said, oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Well, during that, about two weeks after I started to work there, my minister at home, church said, uh, John, I need you to go to church camp and be a sponsor for your brother and other high school kids. And I immediately said, no, I can't. I am working. I have to have the money to go to, to college. He said, well, would you at least ask your boss? So I don't want to lie to the minister. So I went there that morning and I said, would it be any way that I could be off next week to go to church camp because something happened that the minister is not going to be able to go? And they said, well, let's, let's talk about it. No, I said, all I want you to do is say no because I do not desire to go. I don't know why I, anybody would want to go to camp and work with kids like that. And you know what he did? He came back after work that day and he said, hey, we discussed it and you get to go to church camp and you're going to get paid. And I went, that's not what I wanted to hear. Now, folks, when I came back on Monday after the, the week of camp, I pulled up, got out of the car, began to work, walk over till we get in our working trucks, and I hear a voice, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Brother John, I knew God was going to do something. And I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? He said, I can see it. My prayers have been answered. Every night I went to my prayer closet and I prayed that God would, would touch you, that God would bring healing to your life, that God would take salvation to your heart and that you would learn the love of Jesus Christ and he died just for you. And he said, I can see it. And I said, I can see it too. And I feel it too because I had to make a big decision because I felt like I had the voice of God saying, John, when are you going to come home? When are you going to serve me instead of the world? And I was, for some reason, folks, I said, I'm going to go to Bible college for one semester. I made sure God heard that one semester. Well, I stayed more than one semester. A lot of it had to do with the, the girl that God sent into my life, Marie. But, you know, folks, it's amazing. Our prejudice, if we're brought up prejudice, it's still with us if we don't continually work at it. The way to get rid of prejudice is to love the one you feel is unlovable. And that's what Jesus did for you. You and I are unlovable. But he cared enough just for you and just for me. God has first, God has the first and the final word. He rebukes Jonah for loving the plant more than 120,000 Ninevites. What do we love above God? Nobody can answer that but you. What do you love above God? What are you giving God and what energy are you putting in other places more than you're putting with God? I mean, possibly you, you didn't have even prayed today. And possibly you don't pray for weeks. Possibly you don't bless your food. I always bless my food because I don't want that to be what chokes me. And you and I need to understand God's hand is mighty. And God's hand is forgiving. God's hand is compassionate. God's hand is comforting, comforting you and me. But the question is, as it was, to, it, was, it was to Jonah, what do you love, Jonah, above me? What do you love above me? Well, from the beginning, when, when he was called... He already made his mind up because they are the people he's prejudiced against and they've killed Israelite, Israel people before. Who, who do you love? Who would we be if God simply left us to ourselves? Which is a lot of my life I was left to myself because I followed nobody but me and maybe the parents or maybe whoever's disciplinarian around me. But basically, if I'm left all to myself, folks, I will, <laughs> I will mess my life up is worse than what it was before. Because the Bible says, when you come to know the Lord Jesus and you turn away, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. That's an awful sight. Or like a pig returning from a shower, it's gone and jumped back in the mud. And you and I don't want to be that way. We don't want to go back and live worse than we did before because talk about a pain and talk about fear that I would get is because I'm not loving God above everything. The Lord God is first, it says. Who would, be, who would we be if God simply left us to ourselves and stopped running? What would happen? What would happen to us if all of a sudden we said, Okay, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Well, I know in my life, when I was willing to say that, when I said, was willing to say, Lord, come pump in my heart, come live in my heart, come live in my blood, take everything about me, God does mighty things. The ministry was the last thing in my life at that time. 
I had the idea that I'm going to finish college, get my business degree, I have a job waiting on me, I'd be comfortable with that job at the young age of 22, 23, 24, whatever it be, and I could do what I wanted to do and uh, be happy ever after. Well, God had something else. Because at that camp, when God some way put that in my heart, I need to go to Bible college, I went, wow, where did that come from? Because all I could think of, the, all the reasons why. And you know what? They were all selfish, just like Jonah's was. So God has something for us to do. If anything is more important to you than doing the will of God, you need to come to him in obedience and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And God is there waiting. He stands at the door and he knocks at your heart. And he's saying, let me come in and let me live among you and let's, let's go and do the work that God has sent me here to do that I've got to do through you. I, I don't know why, but sometimes we have forgotten as we are Christians longer and longer. We have forgotten what our purpose is. We have forgotten because of selfishness and because of jealousy and because of things going on in our life that God didn't, that's not the heart that God wants me to have. He wants me to have a heart of compassion a heart of love, a heart of serving Him to accomplish what needs to be done. The Lord's coming. There's going to come a day that a trumpet will sound and every knee will bow, every eye will see, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, folks, that's going to be a closing miracle because as He closed out our life here, He's doing it by taking us to be with Him for eternity. Now, I can read what the Bible says, but I really can't visualize what it's going to be like. I've seen pictures but I don't know if that's what it is. All I know is in a twinkling of an eye, he's going to take me. Let's learn from Jonah. And let's stop being rebellious. Let's talk to our neighbors. Stop being rebellious and say, my way or the highway. Why not God's way is the best way. God bless. And let's, let's close with prayer. Father, we love you and thank you that you love us. You give us Jonah as an example. I believe this is a true story that you used a human being to accomplish great things. 120,000 people turned their life over in the whole city. And Lord, how many generations before they turned their back on you, which had to come because they turned away from you. And Lord, lay some soul upon our heart and touch that soul through us. Lord, we don't do the winning, you do. We just go plant the seeds. And Lord, thank you that we can be seed planters and do farming for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.